welcome to our life. I am super excited today for my first of many men edition shows where they will be pulling back their own mask. So before I introduce you to my awesome panel of men, let me give you a quick removing the mask back. Were you aware that most men hide their emotions and do not bring them out with words and they hide them through physical gestures facial changes, and even muscle tensing. So when we return, I will have my first gentleman with me that will be peeling back his mask. So all I can tell you is buckle your seatbelts and get ready. We'll be right back. Do you have less than perfect credit? Are you getting denied for loans and credit cards? Well, contact us today for your free consultation and learn the secrets of financial freedom. We can help with late payments, collections, judgments, bankruptcies, will, trust, and more. We get results. Let us help you. For more information, contact Nikki Ferguson at 281-788-9462. And we're back now, so I hope you fastened your seatbelts because I have my first gentleman with me here today that's about to peel back some of the masks on his journey as a black man. So I want you to help me welcome Mr. Curtis Davis. Thank you, first of all, so much for driving down all the way from Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana to be exact. Shreveport. So thank you so much for driving down. Let's jump into this uh, to give them a little bit of your history. Uh, you went to prison from 1990 to 2016. Yes, ma'am. And um, you were actually sentenced to life, right? Yes, ma'am. And um, you did, is it the ninth applications for post-conviction relief? Uh -huh. uh, I, and you are sitting here with me today. Yes, ma'am. That's a blessing. Well, allow me to say, first of all, that I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to actually share my story with the um, our, our community mm -hmm. and especially our women who mostly watch your show mm -hmm. because a lot of times I, I've always wondered why we're so hard on black men when the primary teachers of black men are 80 percent of the time are women exactly right so I wanted to be able to really share some things with you today because I think that we need healing in our community. Yeah, we definitely do need that. Um, you spent, before you were released, uh, you lost your mother at 14. Yes. You spent 26 years Yes, 25 prison. years, 9 months, and 11 days. Before you were released. Before I was from a, released. From yeah. a life sentence. So tell us about, tell us a little bit about how you were convicted. Because it was, it was a lot of uh, wow. um, stuff. I'm from Compton, California. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's name is Queen Esther Johnson. She's the original Los Angeles welfare queen. She left from Shreveport, Louisiana in the 19, um, 1972 and moved to Compton, California, where she developed a welfare scheme. Her name is actually Queen Esther Johnson. Mm -hmm. And she was able to get like 60 welfare checks a month by training me to be different um, people mm -hmm. as we go to social workers up and down Louisiana. So I, I was 
I was raised with a, a skewed moral compass. Mm, exactly. Not, kind of like coming from a crime family or whatever. Mm -hmm. By the time that she died, I had been through military academies, had trained on the trumpet, the piano, different languages, private tutors. She invested in my education. So I went up to my biological father in Louisiana, and I'm back and forth between him and one of my aunts in California. And um, I just started drifting into a, a darker world because mm -hmm. I had lost my queen. You know what I'm saying? So. And then you kind of grew up in that kind of environment. Yeah, I grew up in a, yeah. in a crime family. Mm -hmm. a, a, just not not my mom, but that just yeah. um, in integers they say a negative time a negative equal a positive. So in the 1970s, an African American that made a million dollars usually made that from a negative. Mm -hmm. multiplying other negatives because of the racial inequities that we had mm -hmm. and we still have during this time right now. Yeah. So by the time that I was 21, I had um, matriculated through um, college. I went to the military and I found myself in Shreveport, Louisiana promoting concerts. And I was promoting in Atlanta, um, Kansas City, Oklahoma. But Shreveport targeted me because they needed to prove that they had outside gang members radicalizing the locals mm -hmm. of the city up there in order mm -hmm. to get gang grants at that time. Okay. And that was in 1990. So it was like they targeted me and said, we want you for this. And it was a crime that was committed by somebody close to me. And I, you know, we have the taboos in our, our neighborhoods and our, our our community mm -hmm. about telling no other people because yeah. we know instinctively whether we want to say it out loud or not that the legal system is designed to harm black people so you don't want to send your people into a system that you believe that's evil yeah right so they said Curtis either you're gonna tell on who done this crime or we're gonna give you life in prison and I just had to trust in God that man um, I didn't really think that they could give me life in prison so that was naivete and yeah. just being gullible, just, not understanding yeah. this man's system. Once they did it, it was like just the most mind blowing thing that you ever want to see because it changed your whole life, your whole outlook. Everything changes. Imagine going life. back into slavery. You, as fly I as would, you are, as I beautiful would. as you are. That tonight somebody just captures you and takes you to a plantation and, I'll, and I'm like gonna Auntie Bella. And I'm going to tell you, because of my mouth, I'll probably be dead. Because that, I'm going to tell them, uh, I'm not going out there. It's too hot. They got I guns. Can't do that. I'm, I, and I'm telling you, I'll probably be dead because of my mouth. And you will be one of the few because yeah. most I'm people not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, are going to capitulate. Most yeah. people are going to say, man, I don't want to be beaten. Most people are going to say, man, I don't want to be shot. Yeah because this is what our system is about now. People all over America and all over the world think that slavery has been abolished. If you Google, when no, was slavery we, abolished? We're in, a, uh, we're, in a, we're in a different type of slavery. But give me, we're in a different type of slavery now. Give me some key points on how the system can work against you. Because I think, I, I've said this before, I think when when kids get in trouble, it, it, and that saying is how how that saying goes is it's easy to get in trouble but hard to get out. Yes, ma'am. That is so very true. And and can you give us some points on how the system works against you? Because the system does work. I it think, does against work against you. When when most people think about the the situation of African-American male people, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to say men because man mean mine and male mean your, your genitals or whatever. Mm -hmm. when, when we think about that, we think, of, well, they're you know, supposed to pull their self up by their bootstraps mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. But we don't have um, a manhood rites of passage as African-American black men. Mm -hmm. When we're 13 years old, we come into the situation, we okay, I'm a man now, but usually that entails something like joining a gang yeah. or something like depending going on out, your environment, you know, yeah. depending on where you're, you're raised that I'm, I'm going to come out and I'm going to show these guys that I'm tough. There's no organized system in our community like the, the Jewish people have bar mitzvah yeah. for their children mm -hmm. or 
um, other cultures have whatever they have. What we, what we don't know is that a system has been designed directly to target our people mm -hmm. and marginalize and subjugate us. Our parents don't really want to teach us about racism. They want to teach us about the traps and the problems that we have. So mm -hmm. we just, you know, end up going through um, the different traps and, and troubles that you find young black men in. You ever wonder why you can take your five-year-old son to kindergarten and his, his pants are up and he's ready to yeah, go. Yeah. And by the time he's 12 years old, They're he's sagging. sagging and his booty is out and he doesn't care anything about the system. Yeah. I think that's something to do with the system. How um, do you think it's too late for us to make changes with the system? Because I've been saying this uh, since, since George Floyd, if not before. Changes need to be made within the system. The legislation on some things need to be changed. We're still living under outdated laws uh, that shouldn't even be in existence anymore for, because of the time we're in. And um, <clears throat> do you think it's too late to make changes? And where do we start? Of course, it is not too late to make changes. But before we make changes or before we're able to make changes, we have to change our minds. We have to change the way that we think about the mm -hmm. situations that we're dealing with right now. So if we understand that our problems are encoded in laws and policies that were written over 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if your boss is white and he doesn't like you, that's prejudice. But if you have a system that's designed against you from the policy and the binary mm -hmm. code and other laws, then that's racism. Yeah. So we can go into the system, rip it up, and rewrite it. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing right now. We're across the country. I don't march. We don't try to do many direct actions. We are changing policies. Right now in Louisiana, we have a bill, um, House Bill 196, mm -hmm. to take the slavery exception out of the Constitution. Everything, slavery has been abolished except for those duly convicted of a crime. Yeah. So that's where we change it. And at. that's what, um, I, I've said this before, you know, Martin Luther King marched, but Martin Luther King got with different people to change or write new laws. New law. And I think that has gone by the wayside. Right. You know, we want to get out of March and now they tear up stuff. And it's feeling you good. Know? We've got that feel good moment. But if you haven't changed changes? anything on paper right. to stand, none of that matters. So we have to attack the policies, Monique. Exactly. How can we help our youth understand that it's a better way in life and prison is not it? Show them instead of telling them. See, most of the time, our people are afraid of our youngsters. Sometimes I'm even afraid, like I'm driving my car at mm -hmm. night and I want to get some gas, but you got five dudes with hoods on out yeah. here. And I'm like, man, this is not a good place for me to stop. Yeah. So if we're afraid of our own children, then where are they going to get their learning from or any type of development? We have to reach them, go to mm -hmm. them and show them every day how we work for the money. But kids today, they are so on this uh, on this thing of my, I'm gonna say microwave. So they want the want it right now, right now, right now. And what they fail to understand is things don't happen right now. Right. It's a process. It's definitely a process. So how do we work with them to understand it's a process? And you need we to process wait. them through it. Our, now, 76% um, of all African American mm -hmm. children are born to single black females. So it's a good thing that your show is directly or originally designed for black females mm -hmm. because they are our salvation. Once women learn to teach children a different kind of way, mm -hmm. then we have a different kind of life. And I'm not blaming women, it's just my, my primary teacher comes from my mother. And I love her and mm -hmm. she's the greatest woman on the planet who's ever lived. But our condition rises from our talk. Our, how we're taught. Okay, what would you uh, have? What would what would have been one thing you would have changed on the night of the shooting? Because it was a shooting. It we didn't go shooting. into that. It was. It was a shooting happened at a dice game um, between one of my closest people and a guy, and they wrestled for a gun. I'm a combat medic. I was trained as a 91 Alpha in the United States Army. Mm -hmm. And he got shot in the stomach and I ran away. 
the one thing that I would change is I would actually administer first aid to him because he didn't have to die that night. And I knew how to save him, but something in me made me just run away. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and this is, and guys, so you say book, slave, state, very, very, apartheid in very America. good route. Read, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Was your brother involved a little bit in this? It was my brother's actual. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Situation. So what is that relationship? Now, I spoke to my brother for the first time in about 30 years, two months ago. And wow. I did that because I've never stopped loving him. Yeah. And he wasn't the reason that I went to prison. The system targeted me because mm -hmm. they felt like I was the one that they needed to be the poster boy for what um, they were trying activity. what they were trying to yeah, do what, what they were trying to do mm -hmm. i held that against him and it mm -hmm. affected my health it affected the relationship of my entire family and i decided man I, I i love you you know even though you never stepped up you never sent me a card a letter a thank you or anything i, I just wanted him to know i love him and when i done that i felt a whole lot better you mm -hmm. understand what i'm saying because you forgave him for yourself for me yeah. For me. And that's one of the things that I think that if we teach black men how to forgive, then we'll mm -hmm. see a whole new bright future for our people mm -hmm. in this country and throughout the world. It took me a long time. I'm 52 years old. I forgave him two months ago. And then, as I said, you said that was after 30 years. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so that that is a that that's a very long time. But you, like you said, you feel much better. Oh man, I'm I'm free. now. Uh, we're I'm doing finally that. free. We're doing that. What what advice or what words of encouragement will you give young men? Because today, especially here in Houston, I don't know about Shreveport, but I know here in Houston, every day we have so much crime, and the young people and and I. Shreveport I, actually has yeah. a higher crime rate than Houston. Really? We have a higher murder rate than Houston. Oh, wow. And it's amazing. Um, we're trying every day to reach out to our kids, to let them know that there are Especially ways the young men. What? to deal with this. You understand? I think that we need life skills training. I think that we need um, black men to step up for it, black young men and teach them what it actually means to be a man. That man does not just mean penis. Man means mind. And you have to develop yourself to a state of mind that you can be respected. And you, how can you be taught if there's no teacher? Exactly, exactly. Uh, tell us what's next for Slave State, for yourself. Give us your social media platforms, all that good stuff. Because you're going back to Louisiana to do it. I am going back <laughs> to, to Louisiana right now for the Bayou Classic. Um, <laughs> I came down here on Bayou Classic morning, and people were like, you going to Houston? I said, man, this is an amazing lady. I'm getting well, an opportunity to coming. be on her first all-men show. So the next thing that we're doing, Slave State is now. Um, we're taking slavery exception out of every constitution across the United States of America. We're working with the Queen of Benin, mm -hmm. um, Africa. We're working with Senator Merkel in um, D.C. He's the senator out of Oregon to do the 28th Amendment for the federal constitution. My next book is called Eight Traps, The Black Man's Guide to Financial Freedom. Um, we usually need seven streams of income to acquire wealth in the United States, mm -hmm. but because of our unique situation as black men, we have to have eight. You understand? I'm going to explain why that is so. <laughs> and I'm the executive, executive director of Decarcerate Louisiana. So we're just, we're all over the place working. It's not about money. I use my book to fund the movement, yeah. you know, so... And God's continuing to bless me. But with it's everything it's I about need. helping. It's about helping. Uh, it's about helping our men and living I, our purpose. Yeah, yeah definitely. What you think we here for? We here for a reason. Yes. We're so here find for our reason. purpose, develop it, and just live your purpose and find that happiness. I'm as happy as I've ever been in my life. That's a good thing. Thank you. That's a good thing. Well, thank you again for being here. You have a safe journey back. Yes, ma'am. To Louisiana. And when we come back, again, keep your seatbelts fastened. <laughs> the plane has not landed yet, so keep your seatbelts fastened.
faster because I will have a group of men uh, with me and when they start peeling back their masses, it will definitely blow you away. So I'll be right back. $100 on chicken nuggets? A hundred dollars on chicken nuggets. Really? Um, how'd you get in my house? I'm with Wisdom Tax. <laughs> wisdom Tax? So you can help me with all of this? Most definitely. Looks like you need help in bookkeeping. So what about maximizing my refund? We can only maximize your refund if you get organized. Here at Wisdom Tax and Financial, we teach y'all to be free. Free. Awesome. So I can be free of these receipts. Most definitely. Please give us a call. Thank you. Can you free yourself out of my house, please? Only if you promise to give us a call. I'll give you a call. So I can be free. Wisdom Tax. Learn to be free. Wisdom tax. Maybe I should give him a call. Oh, how did you get in my house again? Now you know I told you I'm with wisdom tax. Well, I'm glad you showed up because I think I'm ready to get started. Great. Look, I just need you to do one simple step. Visit our website online, www.wisdomtax.org. All right, fill out the application, and we'll get back to you, maybe even in the next 10 minutes. Awesome. I'm about to be free. This is amazing. Yeah, so what... Wait. Hello? Call us at Wisdom Tax, where you learn to be free. And we're back, and I'm in my second segment now, and I have some awesome men with me, so I really hope you kept your seatbelts fastened. Um, they, they got together, and it's several men. I think, what is it, seven? Yes, seven. Uh, and they wrote this book, I Am a Black Man, man ascension of the kings and um this book here truly blew me away uh when it came to men showing themselves in a very transparent way so i want you guys to help me welcome uh my guest that's with me right now mr kenna grissom hello how are you mr all? damon valentine hello. and mr dominique and tell me your last name before i mispronounce it uh buoy buoy yes that is a louisiana name everybody <laughs> thank you all for being here with me don't let them fool you yes they are sharp on my couch <laughs> but they are something serious <laughs> and they are full of jokes. <laughs> so don't let them fool you. <laughs> so what made, I wanna start out before I go into each of your individual stories, what made you guys decide to come along with other men? Uh, Mr. Uh, Farrell E. Phelps couldn't be here with us today. Uh, he's also one of the men that uh, wrote his story in this book, what made you guys come to the point to decide to share in the manner you shared in this book? Well, yeah, with everything that's going on in the black community, as, as far as men are concerned, everybody, you know, we need to get our story out. You know, we need to make people understand that we're human and you know, we're not subhuman, we're not animals. We have feelings, we have wives, girlfriends, kids, and, and we go through the same thing that everybody else goes through. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we, we need to get the word out, so to speak, and this is a perfect time to do so. 
what was what made you come to the point, uh, Damon, to to be so open about your life? Well, um, I'm a mentor, and I specialize in mentoring for young men with absentee fathers. Mm -hmm. So uh, this opportunity, you know, of course, it, I would say it, it was harder than I thought it would be to open up and to rewind mm -hmm. and then play and record for the world to see. But I thought it was necessary because there's so many young men, uh, young black men that need to identify with something. And um, all of our stories are so different. Um, they were. But we have, you know, one thing in common. We're all black men right. and we're being very transparent. And I just know that it's helping a young man out there. You know, it's helping even a woman, you know, to open their eyes and say, you know what, maybe I need to listen more to the brothers. And for a young man to look up and say, you know what, that's me, I can identify, and I have an outlet now. And what about you, Mr. Dominic? <laughs> <laughs> the publisher basically called me and said, hey, can you put together a chapter in about two weeks? And I was like, put together a chapter for what? And she said, oh, this book we're doing. I said, well, what am I supposed to write about, Asha? She's like, oh, I was figuring you can do the mental health one. I said, why would I do the mental health one? <laughs> She's like, don't, Dominique, don't play. You know we know about you. <laughs> so, so that's it. That's you, what, that's, you put our pins inside of the yeah, street. <laughs> that's, that's what inspired me Man. to do it. But now I was glad to be a part of it um, <clears throat> because I don't really know a lot of uh, black men that openly share about yeah. you know those types of issues. Um, so it was it was good to be able to get that story out because um, if you know me, you think I'm this well adjusted comical guy, but mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily think that you know sometimes I cry in the corner with dark room for no reason at all. You yeah. know, so not currently, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. So you put you okay. <laughs> so he put <laughs> boss lady friends. You Darshell, see, Miss Darshell just left the studio. Put you put her business out after she. <laughs> I'm going to call her and tell her. I wasn't going to lie. This. You said <laughs> <laughs> We're being transparent. Transparent, I, my I man. Yeah, I love absolutely. it. I'm going to go into each of your individual, uh, I'm going to say books, because that's, that's kind of what they were. Uh, I'm going to start with Kenneth, and yours was called Unchosen Consequences. And in that, you talk about uh, your parents divorcing. You talk about death, uh, it, death of a male figure that was real close to you. So... My first question, um, I, I'm not going to let that be my first question. Um, explain a little bit of those painful days that you wanted to forget. Let's start there. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> let's start, because you talk, uh, yeah, let's start there. Growing up as a kid, you, you never imagine your parents splitting, you know, when you're mm -hmm. 10, 11. You only hear about it. And I only heard about it, but until it happened, it shocked the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. And and now I, I'm a, a child of divorce. And nine times out of ten, things things don't go right after that. You mm -hmm. know, the effects that it that it has on your kids and my brothers and I I don't have children and it's it's some of it's because of that. Mm -hmm. Um I try to do the right thing so as not to do the same thing my parents did. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's painful even today. But I got married late because of that. And I mean so late. So let's, let's dive a little bit into that because um, your dad was cheating. Yes. And what you yeah. wrote in the book, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit about it. Um, she came to your house. She did. And, and as I've gotten older, I've realized that it wasn't, it wasn't all my dad doing everything. Come, you know, no, it takes two. To come to find out, it was both of them mm -hmm. because it takes two to make a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, stepping out is never a good idea, but as I dove a little deeper into it, I thought, well, okay, yeah, it's, it's both of them that didn't make it work, and they, and they should have made it work for, you know, for the both of us, mm -hmm. for all three of us, actually. So, Have you truly forgave your dad at this point? I have to truly forgive both of them um, for not making it work. Um, you hurt your kids when you do that. You know, you, you really take a lot out of them. 
and you change their lives forever. And there's nothing you can do to really take that time back. So let me ask you this, and this is not one of your questions. Mm -hmm. Would you have wanted them to stay and make it work? Because you and your brother were little still. Uh, we were, I was 11, Yeah, y'all were still little yeah, kids. Yeah. So would you have wanted them to stay and make it work when you were still going to be in the midst of it and nine times out of ten still see the chaos? No. Would that have been would that have been easier to deal with? No, instead they, of the way it. No, they needed to leave. They needed to separate. Yeah, they they were both two different people, and um, unfortunately, people grow apart when 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 you don't when you have a family and you don't concentrate, you concentrate specifically on the mm -hmm. kids and you don't concentrate on your relationship. You know, things go awry. Yeah. So and, and that's probably what happened in that case. So you did talk briefly a few seconds ago about how their decisions affected you with growing up and you got married later, you didn't have kids. Why is it so important not to make the same mistakes in relationships that head to divorce? Well, uh, or just in relationships, the, period. The mistakes are usually right in front of you if you see them. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're they usually are. right in front of you. A lot of times we overlook them. And we, you know, for whatever reason, whether you're young, whether you got stars in your eyes, if somebody's a nut, and 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 if you don't, if you don't realize they're a nut, and people are telling you they're a nut, and I, I use nut as a as a an, an, yeah. an adjective, you know, but it, it, a lot of times it's right in front of you. But most hmm. of us, um, I'm not that type of person, but most people try to fix. The problem that they're seeing. You either try so to so they stay. You either try to fix it or you try to overlook it. When in essence, there is none of that. Yeah, I just I don't do neither. I just leave. As, as well as you should. Like. As, as well as you should. <laughs> yeah, as well as you I, should because I just you leave. waste a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I like yeah. peace, and I yeah. think I think we all should have peace in our homes for sure. I have to have peace in my home if I don't yeah. have it nowhere else. So if I'm coming home to a chaotic stuff and arguing and going back and forth and I know you stepping out or mm -hmm. she's stepping out that that doesn't work for me as I said to everybody in my current wife uh, it should never be that hard no it's not supposed it should to never be. be that difficult it should be relatively easy most of the time what would you say to another young man facing uh, those rough times that you face because some kids well, can just adapt and be like they go in their separate ways, all right. I, I think and then some kids don't. I think it's really difficult not to let it affect you. Just try not to make the same mistakes that they did and try to have an open mind at the same time, but try not to let it just turn your life around like it did mine. What is the number one thing that you want people to get from your story out of the book and your journey? Well, as a black man, it does happen in, in, in every day. <laughs> Um, you know, we as, we as black men are taught not to be weak mm -hmm. and taught not to cry and taught not to, you know, um, show our emotions. Mm -hmm. But in essence, um, it's hard not to do that. So, you know, keep, keep a straight face, brother, and um, know that it's going to be okay and try not to make the same mistake. You have that ability not to make the same mistake as, as your parents did. And I shouldn't say mistake, but... People go through it. Yeah. It is It is how it's phrased. Okay. Mr. Dominique, I'm going to go to you next. You should have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yours is called A Crazy Story. Yeah. Is what you titled it. Yeah. Um, and you talk about depression, suicide thoughts at 11, uh, self-esteem mm. issues in high school, highs and lows. You, you weed was your uh, was your medical prescription. Yeah, from what yeah, I gather, um, until you had a major breakdown. Yeah. So mm. at 11 years old, did you have an idea? Did you have mm. an idea that something was happening to your mental state? Are you? Um, quite honestly. By the time I was 11 years old, I was so used to feeling a certain way, mm -hmm. it had become common to me. And um, at 11 was when I just really, really got crazy about girls. And so apparently I got dissed earlier that day. And I came home, and there's this big, huge television box. And 
I crawled up in it and covered it up. Um, and as I was in there, I thought about, you know, cardboard has an interesting smell, right? It smells like paper. Do it. There's a hint of wood. And mm. if it's a box that you're in, you can even smell the adhesive that's on the tape. You're going to make me so sit in <laughs> You don't want to do it. <laughs> don't do it. So, but basically, what it was is the reason I got in there is because I wanted to turn everything off, turn everybody out, mm -hmm. turn myself off, turn out all the lights, and cover up. It was a coffin. Wow. That's basically what it boiled down to. I didn't know that at the time, but that's what I had makeshift wow. for myself. So, yeah, that was, that's what it was. I would have never thought of Wow. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I, never th I, I would have never thought about that. Give us a look into your life before the breakdown. Oh, man. It was great. I worked in corporate America as a senior designer. Um, I was dealing with uh, clients and offices from Japan to the UK to Dubai, New York, and stuff like that. Um, so, and I was the only designer of the whole company, so all this work came into me. Mm -hmm. So I was used to, you know, being there on the weekends um, from, you know, 8 in the morning to 8 at night and then working at 4 in the morning. Because a lot mm -hmm. of times, the projects I did um, was in, were in a different time zone, being that we were dealing mm -hmm. with Japan or Frankfurt and Germany and stuff like that. So um, there was a certain amount of stress, but it wasn't anything any more difficult than anybody working. Um, and corporate marketing would deal with communications. So everything was okay. I had my usual stresses and everything like anybody else. But then, I don't know what, after my fifth or sixth year, something happened. And it wasn't, it wasn't something, um, it wasn't something tangible. It was just something that started gradually changing in my head. And it wasn't something I could recognize as and I'm starting to feel down. It was so gradual, mm -hmm. I thought I was just tired at first. Yeah. You know, and from there it, you know, I won't even say spiral because it gradually went down to after the second year, that's when it hit. But you rock. was dealing with, before that rock bottom, mm -hmm. you was dealing with the highs and the lows yes. throughout your whole life. Right, and you and know, you that's, that's correct, but um, with the, the things I dealt with throughout life, I don't think they were that much different than any other, you know, teenage boy or mm -hmm. something like that experience would experience, but the way I internalized it is where the difference was. I remember one time I was sitting in uh, the bathtub after another bad distance at school, and uh, that's the first time I thought about offing myself, right, mm -hmm. doing oil myself. And I was sitting in the tub, and I looked down at the hairs on my arms, and I said, you know what, if you kill yourself, you're killing every single hair on your arm. How's that fair to them? And I came back out. I would come back out. Wow. So, yeah, that was that was my quote-unquote coping. Thing. What What mm -hmm. are some tips uh, that you use or we can use for stress, depression, and dark days? Uh, one of the main things is the thought stoppage. It's actually um, a terminology that is used by therapists, and what it is um, is if something happens and you see yourself kind of getting a little low or whatever, stop your thoughts from running off. Because mm -hmm. what will happen is you'll be like, um, so-and-so said they need to have a meeting with me. This other guy just got laid off by this person. Yeah. Is it going to be my time? And it, instead, instead of saying, so-and-so needs to have a meeting with me, stop it. Stop the thought right there and go off and do something else because they can roll and roll and roll. So that's, that's one of the things. And just listen. Look out for the signs. And the main thing is know your triggers. Um, everybody has several triggers that will send them off into um, a depressive state or where they're um, overly stressed. Um, some of your triggers could be a person, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of your triggers could be the sound of somebody's voice because you know how much that person torments you, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you see somebody that looks like them, your whole body could turn and start shivering mm -hmm. and stuff. So it's basically um, knowing your triggers and when you know your triggers, you kind of know what to avoid as much as you can. So you kind of answered my other question because I what would you say to another man dealing with mental illness but scared to face it? Because I think with with any African American person, they really don't want to talk about mental illness, let alone a man right. uh, having to bring out that they have some issues. So what would you say to them with that? Um, see, how can I say no, if it's, just be straight out. If you can imagine, as a man, if you can imagine somebody coming and slapping the piss, I'm sorry, out of your mouth. You can say that. 
at your mama. <laughs> Mm. Imagine the rage you would get. Mm -hmm. That's the type of aggressive rage you should have against fighting your mental illness. Mm. Period. Nobody's, you, there's no, shouldn't be any fear there. It, sh it shouldn't be. Because all the things that, that can spin off of you having some thoughts and you know, some emotions that you're not really putting a lot of investment into because of you know, um, being ridiculed by our community and things mm -hmm. like that, the, um, the price you have to pay, man, just don't wait till you're 35 like I did. Otherwise, you'd be walking around Houston for three days with cut off jeans and a dirty T-shirt. Yeah, because you that's when you hit your your the big breakdown. Yeah, yeah that's when I went off and spent thirty five hundred dollars of the company card. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. It get real interesting. But um, yeah, by the grace of God, I didn't even get reprimanded for it. So. But it could have went way worse. That was a blessing. Yeah. That was a blessing. What advice do you have for family members dealing with a person with mental health? Because that's another thing. Family members don't really. Yeah. Um, their family members are embarrassed to say that their family member has a problem. Right. Or and then they don't want to deal with it, and they don't really deal with it until, unfortunately, the police has shot them. Yeah. Their family member and the, and the person is dead. Then they then you want to say, oh, he had mental problems. Well, right. why exactly. you get him help? Because I know when my mother was the way she was, my father did everything he needed to do to make sure when she got off balance, he brought her right back to the hospital. Mm. Every Absolutely. time he moved, he removed every knife. We we had plasticware to use. He removed every weapon except one that he forgot and she remembered, mm. you know. But he did everything he needed to do to make sure she got help. My family, and I was a kid, so my family didn't shield me from from her mental illness. Right. I knew she was ill. I didn't look at her differently. I didn't treat her differently when she came home. When, when she came home, I was a teenager. I didn't treat her differently. I didn't look at her differently. My family didn't look at her differently. And when she came back, finally, she was like our old self, like nothing happened. Mm. You know, but my father and my family made, they, we weren't embarrassed. It was like, okay, she got problems, so right, we have right. to get her help. Right. Um, I have to say, basically, you, you hit it right on the head with the way um, your father supported your mother. Um, it's about patience, it's about support, it's about mm -hmm. understanding. And you have to talk to a professional, read some uh, articles, mm -hmm. so you're better um, able to identify what's going on with this person. So if it seems like they're overreacting to this, or they're over, you have a better understanding as to why these things are, yeah. and you can help them or help them uh, guide themselves toward you know, a more ease of functioning in, uh, in, in, uh, sorry, in day to day activities. So the I am a black m man, Ascension of the Kings. You, uh, this is uh, Boss Lady's Press. That's her, you told me her brother? Uh, yes, that's actually her. Uh, her brother and her wife. Brother and her um, sister-in-law. Sister-in-law, mm -hmm. and you did the cover, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Grisham uh, shot the photo. I shot the photo. You shot the photo. Know. Yeah, and he and shot the photo. And I did the typography, yes. And you, yeah. I love this. Thank you. I love this. So they not only contribute their stories in this book. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sweat That's, equity. Look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I told you boss lady be working me and him. <laughs> a lot of sweat equity in that. <laughs> Michelle, they talking about you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they, you, they only, uh, they also oh, contribute you. in this beautiful cover of this book. Mm, it's nice. It's, it's yeah. very and telling. It, the whole book was. <laughs> I've never read a book and cried and carried on, and that's y'all fault. Yeah, it's Kenneth. So <laughs> let me <laughs> let me move on here to Mr. Dama Valentine. Yours is called God's Plan. Yes. So you were a young father, took custody of your son. Yes. Um, you've always dealt with stereotypes and judgment for black men. Um, you were a father at a young age. 2010, you got custody of your son. And yes. he was still young from what I remember in the book. 10 years old. Yeah, he was 10 years old. What would you say to a young man that has a father figure in the house, but is still going down the wrong path? Because I had a father, we had a, my parents were married for almost 60 years before my father died. 
And yeah. I have a brother. My brother went to prison. My brother did all kind of stuff. And to this day, my brother still feels that we sisters need to take care of him. Mm. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> mm, <that's> <laughs> yeah. So how to tell me, how does how do we deal with a young man that has a father figure, a, a real good role model, but you still want to hang out with the bad boy? Yeah, you know, um, the times have changed Very so much. So. The mm -hmm. social media, the, um, and, and you know what? I won't say that the activities have changed, but now they can just turn to their phones and see it. Yeah. Yeah. So you got mom, dad in the house. You can have a Christian, Catholic, whatever, religious family. But when you open your phone, the first thing you see is twerk music, money, yeah. you know, name brands. And um, you see an image of a man mm -hmm. that's accepted by the world. Um, you look at your dad, you respect him because that's your dad. Mm -hmm. But you're a young man and you want to fit in. You want to go to school, you want to be accepted. Uh, you may or may not have the latest shoes and clothes so you do everything that you can to um, fit in mm -hmm. you know sometimes it's uh, the drugs yeah you know sometimes it's the activities sometimes it's um, man show me who you are by doing what we do you know um, and that's a big challenge now because it's in your face you know, back when we was young, I remember I didn't have YouTube. And yeah, we didn't have none of that. I didn't that. have none of that, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, with me, I was able to kind of just stay in this lane, you know. But now it's a challenge. I raised my son and he saw everything. It's like, Dad, um, why go to college when I can, I could just get it quick. Yeah. And I'm like, well, son, it don't work like that. And that's, that's, that's what me and Mr. <laughs> Curtis talked about. A lot of people want to just get it. Every, the kids today want to get it quick. It's the now yes. generation. Yeah, and, and I don't, uh, I don't be understanding yeah. that at all. How is it important to love yourself first before you try to love someone else? Um, that's very important. And I talk about that, too, um, especially with the young men, because what ends up happening is that... Um, you find people who can't love somebody else correctly because they don't love themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people, you get the best out of everybody else when you are the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. You know how to treat people. And that people. is very true. It's very true. Yeah. You know how to love somebody. You know, I tell a young man, you know, um, at some point you're going to have a wife, you know, and it's very important for you to know who you are and who you are not mm -hmm. because as a man you're a leader you know and you'll be amazed at who's looking at you and they say man this guy looks like he has some respect for himself it looks like he uh, uh, has ambition he has drive he knows who he is and it turns them to a channel that <coughs> says you know what maybe I need to look at myself too and I think that's really what true love is uh, for family members for husbands for wives you know who you are and who you are not. Mm -hmm. Love yourself and say, I have boundaries. Okay, I stayed when you did this, but this the boundary. Yeah. And I have to let you go. I still love you, but I love myself. And I can't let you do myself. I can't let you do me like that. Because I love me so much. And um, that's a connection that you have to have with God. Because God, uh, you pray to him. It may not come in the time that you want, but oh, he'll but show you who you are yeah. and who you are not. Mm -hmm. So you got to love yourself first. What are um, some tips that you would give us? Say, well, let me do this instead. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do not to get overwhelmed with your son moving in full time when you took custody? Because you were still young yourself. And mm -hmm. to take on that responsibility, you weren't married, mm -hmm. and it's just you and your your teenage son, or he was 10. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you do not to get overwhelmed? Because I think other men that have to take that responsibility might get overwhelmed oh, yeah. and drop the ball somewhere mm -hmm. down the line eventually. Right, right. Or feel that they will. What, what did you do not to get overwhelmed? Um... My chapter is titled God's Plan, and it's really because God had a plan for me 
that I didn't know until all the dots started connecting. Mm -hmm. I was always in my son's life, you know. Um, he was born a preemie, he was four pounds. Dr. Smith, you know. Um, and they called and said, he's here, come, you know. So I, I was there and I was there when he was born. Um, my father gave me the greatest blueprint, the greatest gift that I could ever receive in life. Mm -hmm. And that was how to be a father, how to be a leader, how to take accountability, and just how to be ready for doing the right thing. There's so many steps I had to take to get to that November 2010 <coughs> day when I got custody of him mm -hmm. um, that I didn't have to prepare. It was just one day to the next. All I did was just walk into it. I was ready. And the story is so crazy. Um, the God's plan has so many meanings of my, the, the title of my chapter because from one day to the next, I had custody of my son. Mm -hmm. And this is a situation to where his and he's, mom. he's, what, 20 some years old He's now? 21 now, yeah. December 22nd. And this is a situation where his mom was over there you know, got a husband and all that. Mm -hmm. And even if she was homeless on the street, she wouldn't call and say, come get him. Mm -hmm. But God made a way. Yeah. He made a way for a black man, okay, who normally pay, paying child support, okay, and has this bad relationship from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. I had my son in my custody. And I didn't have to prepare for it. I already was taught, I was already groomed how to be um, a father, how to be a man, how to be a leader and be accountable. So what would you, what, what is one or two tips that you would give to a single mother raising boys? Because I hear this a lot. Mm -hmm. And y'all correct me if I'm wrong. I want all y'all opinion on this. I hear this a lot that, uh, I'm gonna say society, feels that women we're not capable of raising men alone. And I disagree with that because I know some single mothers that have raised boys that are well educated, well put together and, and all that, but they feel that we can't, that we, we're not supposed to, or we're not supposed to fully, you know, you, men need to play some kind of part in that because we're not able to teach them everything so tell me give me some two tips mm -hmm. or so or if y'all have tips on that as well on on what a single mother I'll let Damien start so that's actually what my aim I have a mentoring organization and it's called Young Kings yeah that's yeah. Like, so that's, I had that. I was working that up, but you just brought it right in there, so no problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here yeah. we go. <laughs> so that, that's the interactive kids book that I made. That's actually my son at the age of 10 that I illustrated the book from. That was my way of celebrating God's, you know, the turning point in my life. I went back to the age of 10 and made a character in his image mm -hmm. at the age of 10. And if you see a picture of him, he looked just like that when he was 10. He older now, he ain't that cute no more. But uh, <laughs> now nah, he's a handsome man. But um, in his crown, the stones, they represent mm -hmm. King, King knowledge, integrity, nobility, and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. And this book is designed for um, all young men, but especially for that young man who doesn't have the father around. And the mom is there. And the mom is looking and she's like, I love my child, I love my young man, but there's some things that I can't, get to him, I can't mm -hmm. talk to him about it. I can't identify. First, I wanna say that women do an amazing job of raising young men. Um, young men that have just mom, they learn how to respect women. They should. Like they learn how to look at mom and say mom is everything. Mm -hmm. So I wanna empower all the single mothers out there right now and let you know that you're doing an amazing job. Keep doing it. You're doing a job of two people. Mm -hmm. Um, this book is just a tool to let them know that they are a king. They have knowledge, they have integrity, they, have no, they can be noble and be a gentleman. Um, it's always great to have a role model, a positive role model around if you can. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have, you know, my mentors. If you can, um, if a young boy can see a, 
uh, identify with a, a man and say, you know what, he looks like me. You know, you know what, I, I, I want to be a doctor. But, I, but this is what I tell kids when mm -hmm. I, I speak to kids and see kids. Regardless if you do not see mm -hmm. anyone of what the dream you have in your head to be, mm -hmm. make, it come true. make it come true yourself. Yeah, make it come true. Yeah. Make it come to light yourself. And don't mothers don't are keep waiting to see someone like that because you may never see someone like that. Yeah, yeah. Make it come true. Yeah. Make it come to light yourself. What yeah. What do you have to say about uh, uh, women raising men? Uh, well, my grandmother raised me by herself. Mm -hmm. You know, see how fantastic I turned out. You, <laughs> you know, amen. <laughs> so, uh, but now the thing of it is, is yeah, you know, her, she had her brothers that would be influenced. Um, uh, her son, my uncle, would mm -hmm. be somewhat of an influence, um, but not to not to the point where you would kind of imagine. Because um, she taught me how to uh, to uh, kill chickens and. Um, tea feather them and fry them yeah. and cook. Mm. She taught me how to grow a garden. She taught me how to fish. She taught me how to hunt. And she taught me how to shoot the right person. You know, that's how my grandmother, that one person, raised I like me to your do grandmother. all of these things. Your grandmother did it all. Mm. Yeah. So it's possible. That's all I'm saying. It's possible. What about you, Kim? There's unfortunately always going to be a lack of when you have a single parent in a house, whether you have a woman raising, a, you know, boys, which mm -hmm. my mom did. And my dad was there, but... Um, you're always going to have a lack of, and if, if it's a reverse of, if it's mm -hmm. a man raising a, a daughter, mm -hmm. you're going to have some, uh, you're going to yeah. have some deficiencies in there. Yeah. And hopefully, somebody will come along in your life to fill those voids, which is um, a friend of mine mm -hmm. uh, did that in, in, uh, yeah, that in the book, and he filled mm -hmm. a void in mine, and uh, I thank him for that. Mm -hmm. But um, it's it's you're not going to get everything from one parent. And mm -hmm. um, yep. you just try to take bits and pieces from that parent, and mm -hmm. maybe again, maybe you'll meet somebody that's feeling the rest. And if not, then you just do what you can. You know, yeah. you you do what you can, and you be the best person you can. It's just it's not always going to work. You know, I don't know how to fix cars as much, mm -hmm. but I do now because of a friend. The friend that I don't mm -hmm. know how to cook, and I lived with my mom. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I know how to make a bowl of cereal. Okay. You know what I mean? Man, so, you gotta start somewhere. and then yeah. later on, you find somebody who can do all that for you. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still waiting for somebody to do all of this. Sometimes it does, and sometimes it comes <laughs> along. Sometimes it will. I was fortunate. <laughs> if you don't mind, I, I do want to add that, especially um, black women. Mm -hmm. uh, black women have something very strong inside of them. It don't matter if you have one boy, two boys, five boys, you know, they have that, that heart, that love, and that strength, mm -hmm. and they just have it. And they gather them all, get them off of school, get dinner going, go through the pain, go through, you know, all the, 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 the pressures of society, and they still go, you know, and, and stay strong. And they're, uh, they're the strongest and the toughest to break, mm -hmm. and also the most delicate. And um, I appreciate, you know, that um, from the black women, you know, and I just wanted to say that uh, they most definitely can raise a young black man to be a strong black man. Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank each of you for coming. Uh, I hope y'all come back. Y'all gonna come back? Absolutely. I want y'all to come back. You not come, you don't want to come back? I mean, he ain't had nothing to eat in the green. I'll make sure he comes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make. I'll feed him first. We we'll make sure he comes with a. I'll feed him first. What? And then we are gonna come over here. Oh my god. He wanted donuts. He, he wanted said, donuts. I didn't have any donuts for Mr. Dominique, <laughs> so he said he will not come back to my show. <laughs> we'll make sure we get a, a dozen baker's dozen. Yeah. Bring him in. Glazed. Oh my god. Glazed. Okay. So can each of you, if you have social media handles and stuff like that, can you give that information? Uh, definitely, mm -hmm. thank you all for coming. You guys need to definitely check out. It's a great book. A great book, an yeah. awesome book. And I love this, it's I love the book. colors awesome. of this Andrew little King. book. That's a young black superhero. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> I'm 41 it. and I've, I've never, I cannot remember a black superhero growing up. 
like a young black superhero. No, I can't. Oh, there wasn't a black Shoot, superhero. I can. No. I was in the comics. To illustrate. Was in I was in the comics. So we, uh, black Vulcan. He okay, we we not gonna go into all that. <laughs> Give me your social media. Uh, <laughs> I know social media. I'm not in all that. You not in all that. I ain't in all that. What? Okay, just <laughs> <laughs> oh, get Lord. this book so you can check out <laughs> Mr. Dominique Store because he's not in the social media. <laughs> you gotta buy the book to get him. Oh my god! Ain't nothing God. wrong with that. I am too through. Uh, moving oh, on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably going to make up for his because I got too many social media. Okay, don't, make it quick. I, we, I have it's another quick. segment, don't. Yeah, so as far <laughs> as the book, everything is I Am A King Rap Book. Okay. The website, imakingratbook.com. You can order the book. I Am A King Rap Book for the Instagram and also for the YouTube, okay? Okay. And um, through there, you can find me. My mentoring organization is youngkingsmentoring.com. And uh, on IG is Young King's Mentoring, okay? Okay. See, that was short because I was about to throw him off and just move on I to Kenneth. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. um, I'm on Facebook. It's Kenneth Grissom, K-E-N-N-E-T-H-G-R-I-S-S-O-M, actor, photographer. Uh, Opia Photography on Facebook also. Opia Photography underscore on uh, Instagram also, actor. Oh, that. That. <laughs> that. You do it all. So I'm I'm gonna be looking for a tell Darshell. I'm gonna be looking for another book. Mm -hmm. uh, what next year? That enough time for you? Cause you only had two Why weeks last time. Like oh yes, <laughs> we're, we're getting it going. Everybody. Oh y'all, this man is fast. Yeah, going. yeah you only had two weeks last time. I'm gonna give you a whole another gotcha. year. Good, good point. Good point. We'll, we'll stay on. Fair enough. So guys, said we'll stay on. Him. <laughs> Thank you again for being here with me. Thank you for we have Thank one you, more yeah, segment. We're going to come into the last segment with the one and other Mr. Cam Hill. So, again, keep your seatbelts fastened and we'll be right back. The Adolf Group at Equity House Properties. We provide residential, commercial, leasing apartment locating. We provide consulting on home buying, home selling, and credit restoration. We help with private investments to All Faith Investment Corporation. Contact us now, the Adolf Group at Equity House Properties. We make real estate your reality. Hi, this is Willie Adolf of the Adolf Group at Equity House Properties. I'm here today to talk to you about home purchasing. You know, a lot of times people want to know where do we start, when do we start, how much do we need to save, what our credit score needs to be like, can I really move in now, and the answer is yes. The thing is, is that you want to get pre-approved first before you even go house shopping because what you wouldn't want to happen is that you find the perfect home, but the bank won't qualify you for your mortgage. So always get pre-approved first. So find a good lender, which we are having a lot of resources for you on that. Second, you want to make sure that anything that's on your credit, if it's something that you can work with, let's work with it. Because everything on your credit, you know, it depends on what it is for each mortgage company. And third, once you get that pre-approval, now it's time to go house shopping. Now, Willie, what about the money, the down payment and things like that? Well, they have a lot of programs that's out there. So based on your credit, it will depend on the down payment assistance that you can receive. But we do have a lot of resources and a lot of things that can help you. And everyone with the Adolf Group will hold you by your hand and walk you through the whole process. So you can contact us at www.theadolfgroup.com or 281-451-7087. And remember, when you have will, you have a way. All right, guys, I hope you still have your seatbelts fastened. We are back in my last segment, and I have no other one <laughs> than the amazing Mr. Cam Hill from the Cam Hill Show sitting here with me today. So let's welcome him. Cam, thank you for finally. Because <laughs> I think we've been talking about this since last year. How you going to throw us out there? Yes. I'm just saying. <laughs> 
So thank you for being here with always, me today on oh, my first edition of my men's show. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I definitely want to do more and more in men's shows. Now, Cam, if you don't know who Cam Hill is, you need to go ahead and Google him. <laughs> <laughs> See how she threw me out there. Cam, okay. Cam okay. Hill has a phenomenal uh, talk show that I have been on that's mm -hmm. based here in Houston. Mm -hmm. But Cam Hill not only is a talk show host, Cam Hill is a real estate agent. Yes. For many, many years, many years. as well. So we're going to jump into this. So looking back at your childhood, what are some lessons you learned from uh, that are you still playing a part in your life? Because you talked about how your dad. You talked a lot about your father and how he showed you multiple streams of income right. and always having that side job. Yes, So tell absolutely. me about that. Absolutely. So what my dad did, he's a truck driver. Mm -hmm. And uh, being a truck driver, you would meet a lot of people during that time. But also people, if they lost anything, you know, during that process, maybe a home, a mm -hmm. car, something like that, he would just pay the arrears. You would sign that property over to him and then he would keep paying on it and resell it. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of that. So the problem that I had with, with it was I was the one who had to clean it up. Oh, I was the have to refurbish it. I would be the one to have to get it back into so that tip was your, cut. That was, that was your my side, job. That was your that was side, my side job. job. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? I started at seven years old. Oh my and God. my dad then uh, went ahead and he bought a strip center. Mm -hmm. And in that strip center, he had a barber shop. A uh, restaurant, a uh, lounge. We used to call them lounge with their bars, mm -hmm. you know, clubs. Yeah. And uh, so I would learn customer service. The customer is right. Okay, that's the first not, thing he always said. Not, not all the time. Not right, all not time. on time. Not listen to Cam. <laughs> <laughs> In our aspect, <laughs> we said the customer is right. Not all the time, yeah. but yes, we that I learned customer service at the time. Whatever you did, and I always think about, and I live by this with Martin Luther King, and what he said was life's most persistent and urgent message is, what are you doing for others? That's the question. Exactly. Right? So I live by that all of my life now. What am I doing for others? I try to celebrate people on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. I try to promote people's uh, businesses or promote anything black, black businesses. Mm -hmm. That's really what I live for, and that's really what I look for. And my show now is building, you know, I try to mm -hmm. build, build a bridge to the opportunities for others. Yeah. Not just me. I want to celebrate. I like to celebrate others. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. How do you view real estate now since COVID-19? Now that COVID-19, it really has flourished, strangely enough. Really? Yes, because the interest rates are so low. Our interest rates are under 3%, if they're not at 3.25. Okay. I remember my first property in 1987 that I purchased, it was 15%. I had excellent credit, my mother signed with me. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole different concept. Yeah. So that means that I had a client of mine that bought something at 350,000, 2,600 is the total note, taxes, and insurance. So it's and that's what people are paying for, you know, rental pro I mean, rental property. How apartments. long do you think it's going to stay that way? I think it'll be here for a while. I think it will. Even with us opening back up? Now that we're opening back up, you still have a lot of people, over 40 million people unemployed. Yeah, you do. You so do. you still need that economy uh, to be moving. So with the interest rates low, people are still buy able to buy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you touched a little bit about the Cam Hill Show, but tell us about the Cam Hill Show. And because you were also in radio before yes. you moved over to TV. Yeah, so absolutely. So tell us about that. Tell us about that whole journey so and the, what so started you. Right. So the journey started about two years ago. Um, uh, March 19th was my celebration day for my two years. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I was doing it two years ago for my birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorenzo Butler, shout out to him. Mm -hmm. He came to me and he said, we have an opportunity at this radio station. Uh, it was downtown Houston. I could go in. My goal was 90 days. I was just gonna do this thing for 90 days. Wasn't gonna do it any longer than that. That was my plan to mm -hmm. do that. Because I remember over 30 years ago, I had gone to one of the radio stations. The major radio stations. Ra major radio mm -hmm. stations, going into sales, and they said the uh, amount at the time was 35,000 to 45,000 salary. I said, oh, uh-uh, let me, mm -mm, that's not gonna work. <laughs> I gotta get a, you know, a job. At the, you know, at that time we were mm -hmm. making money. I was going, doing something else. I said, no. And that's what, that was one thing to push me into real estate. 
But in doing so, God always has a plan. Mm -hmm. He always, if he tells you to do something, you do it. Yeah. You'll eventually do that. Mm -hmm. So I came in 90 days, now two years later. But what I wanted to do, I wanted to be something like an unsung. I knew so many people, and I still know mm -hmm. a lot of people, that had never been celebrated. Yeah. People didn't know about what they were doing. So I was bringing them on the show. Little did I know I was supposed to charge them to come on the show. Mm -hmm. People kept asking, Cam, everybody is coming on your show, why? Didn't know that was the, 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 the caveat mm -hmm. to it. But in doing so, I love to give back. I yeah. love to celebrate people. I think celebration of others does not take away from celebrating me. No, you know? and it shouldn't. It, it really pushes it up, yeah. you know? So I love uh, just the black community in itself because as a child, I wasn't privy to that. I had always gone to white schools. Mm -hmm. I had always had to compete with other uh, nationalities that were not looking like me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to then go to a black school, and that's how I got here, okay. to Houston, Texas. Why do you think some men refuse to live a transparent life? I think the re rejection. I know rejection is a big thing. Mm -hmm. We, If we said or we are very open about who we are, mm -hmm. We're not only be rejected, we'll be ridiculed. We're not supposed to be able to uh, have emotion yeah. at all. We're not supposed to cry. We're not supposed, we're supposed to be strong all the time. Yeah, and that's not. And that's not true. No, it's not true. Not at all. So that's a huge thing that we have, we have covered up. We don't even hug our sons. No. We don't kiss our sons on the forehead or on the cheek or whatever. I'll we tell don't them have any embrace, embrace our children. Mm -hmm in what, whoever they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you say to a young man that's headed down the wrong path? What I would tell a young man at that time would be, we have choices. Mm -hmm. Freedom is our choice. A big one. And whatever you do at that time mm -hmm. will follow you. Be sure you make that right choice. For a business owner, for business owners that are scared to step out on faith, mm -hmm. what advice do you have? Because I think a lot of, I think the pandemic, people mm -hmm. was all, oh, well, I'm going to wait to do something. Right. And then even before that, well, I shouldn't do this. Are they listening to somebody tell them they shouldn't do that? What, do you, what, do you, what is your advice? Because I just do it. Me too. Uh, but a young man who came on my show on yesterday, Carlos Wallace, shout mm -hmm. out to him. He said risk is a component of success, and it is. You have to take mm -hmm. that risk. You have to jump. Steve Harvey always talks about, you know, making the jump, mm -hmm. making the leap. If you don't do that, you always be content wherever you are. If you are trying to break a ceiling, if you're trying to go higher, if you're trying to do something outside of the box and out of the lane, you have to take that risk. Now, with risk is ridicule. Mm -hmm. Huge ridicule. People yeah, are going to talk about lot. you. People are going to, even friends, even the friends that you thought were friends and family, mm -hmm. you may have to leave them behind. And that's really huge. I did. And sometimes it's a good thing to leave them behind. It is, but it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. When you know that you have family members and people that are uh, very close to you that you have to leave behind, it's kind of like getting on a plane. You can't take everything with you. No. They, you have, a, they, 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 have, a, they have a weight limit. They tell you, okay, that's too heavy. If you want to keep bringing all these bags, you're going to have to pay for them. Yeah, exactly. And some, they're not going to let you. you know, they have mm -hmm. a limit of how many you can bring on. So that's how it goes in life. You have a limit. Not everybody is going to go on your journey with you. And not everybody's mm -hmm. supposed to. No, not at all. You know, some people are, uh, are sentence in your, in, your chap in your book. Mm -hmm. Some are a chapter, you know, in mm -hmm. your book. And some, one girl said, just, one is just a letter. So, I mean, <laughs> a word. A word in your book. <laughs> Most definitely. Uh -huh. So, tell us how we can um, keep in touch with you, follow you, the Cam Hill Show. What's next for you and the Cam Hill Show? Ah, uh, well, the Cam Hill Show.com. <laughs> you can find everything on there. Go to my YouTube. Uh, channel. I have every show from Nephew Tommy to Sherry Shepard to, oh my God, to The Whispers, mm -hmm. Eddie Levert. Everybody. You. Everybody. Man, <laughs> I, do, I try to get everybody. I want some more people. I want you. Where are you at? What, come on the show. <laughs> What's going on with you? <laughs> yeah, so I'm telling you, just at this point, we're getting ready to do live. Mm -hmm. 
like where the audience will be. Okay, cool. Yeah, big audiences. I'm ready to come to the, to the arenas and things like that. I've been waiting on COVID. Okay, yeah, COVID, uh, COVID you know, is a... Uh, trying to put that together, but people yeah. have wanted, really wanted to see the celebrities live. And that's going to be awesome. I will be in the audience. They want to see the celebrities. So let me know which celebrity you want to see. We're going to have them live. <laughs> we'll be in the audience. <laughs> I want to say thank you for being here with me today, finally. <laughs> you see how she threw me under the bus. Finally, because hey, we've been, it, help it, me, friends. But it, help was, me. it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. It was just planted. It was just planted yeah. on my end in COVID. Yeah. You know, so thank you for being here with me today. Oh, man. Um, you definitely have to be back this year. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you this for the year, opportunity. This year, most definitely. If you need any information on any of our guests, please contact the Our Life TV Show at gmail.com. Always like, follow, share the Our Life TV Show. You can catch me every Wednesday at 8 p.m. on the On Point Network, also on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, Xbox, AT&T Now, and in the Houston area, all our access cable channels. Until next time, guys, when I bring the Mother's Day special to you, always empower, always encourage, pull up to the table without fear, but with confidence, and continue to remove your mask.